in head and neck cancer, we have after following surgery, we have patients with low risk, patients with high risk, and patients with intermediate risk in between us. So high risk patients are who have extra capsulary extension or positive margins. Low risk are small tumors without any lymph node invasion, etc. So for the low risk patients, surgery is enough. You don't do anything more. For high risk patients, you should do your whole uh, treatment that you have, and intermediate risk is still discussion, but some of them you do post-operative chemoradiotherapy, some of them you do definitely post-operative radiotherapy. For the low risk, you don't do anything after surgery, and high risk, you do chemoradiotherapy. So there are um, two big trials, uh, phase three randomized trials compared chemoradiotherapy versus uh, radiotherapy. So I, I presented these two trials. I'm one of the co-authors of one of these trials. They were b both published in New England Journal of Medicine a long time ago. And uh, these two trials show that the use of chemoradiotherapy in high-risk patients or even intermediate-risk patients are, is better than the postoperative radiotherapy alone. But the European trial was positive in local regional control, disease-free survival, and survival. And the American trial was not positive for survival, but it's positive disease-free survival and local regional control. Then we did a meta-analysis by putting those, they, these two trials, uh, was published in Head and Neck, then the American group and the URTC get together. And uh, we saw that the both try the, the common uh, incli inclusion criteria patients in both trials, they have significant uh, effect of chemo chemoradiotherapy compared to radiotherapy alone in overall survival, disease-free survival, and local regional control. But patients who are outside of the intersection of these two trials, because you are a European trial had different factors other than extracapsular extension and our, uh, positive margins like lymphovascular invasion, per perineural invasion, etc. And the American trial had two or more positive lymph nodes other than extracapsular extension and uh, positive margins. So we observed that if you look only those patients, you, do, you didn't see so much influence of chemoradiotherapy. A little bit more for the European type of secondary uh, inclusion criteria, but much less for the two or more positive lymph nodes. And then in 2007, there was another meta-analysis. We put, put, put these two trials plus two other small trials, randomized trials done in France and Hungary. And they published in Head and Neck in 2007 saying that the p-value was significant for local regional control and overall survival when you have the data from these four trials and also I presented a little bit what is going on currently. The current clinical practice for head and neck cancer globally is when you have a positive margin and uh, extracapsular extension you do definitely postoperative chemoradiotherapy. So uh, for an intermediate risk patient um, you do postoperative radiotherapy but it depends if the patient has young and has a little bit more risky disease than the other ones, for example, if, he ha if she or he has perineural invasion, lymphovascular invasion, uh, then you might do uh, include chemotherapy as well to the radiotherapy. But if it's not very fit patient or some age because we know from the meta-analysis from the definitive chemoradiotherapy that patients who are more than 65, 70 years old, they don't benefit so much from chemotherapy. We don't have this data for the postoperative, but you can make the link between then you may give only postoperative radiotherapy these kind of patients. But if there is an extra capsular extension and uh, positive margins, then you do definitely chemoradiotherapy if the patient is medically possible to do the chemotherapy. The next step we were thinking to do uh, anti-GFR treatment. Um, we had, let's say, as a phase three study, there was a UR plant and I mean, it came to the just a couple of days before it started, it was everything was ready, the 22071 URTC study, which wanted to co compare 
radio chemotherapy plus or minus panitumumab, which is an anti-GFR antibody, uh, the commercial name is Vectibix. And uh, this study was ready, everything was done, but the, the, the last moment Amgen, which was the sponsor of the trial, decided to not to do the study because of the, uh, another study, this phase three study, which negatively resulted in the uh, <coughs> metastatic patients. Uh, there is a phase two randomized American study, the RTOG0234 study, which, com which it didn't compare, it's a, the, the two arms, experimental arms, combining cetuximab with cisplatin or cetuximab with docetaxel, and they saw that, they observed that the docetaxel plus uh, cetuximab in postoperative setting gave better results, so they are, uh, they, they opened now a phase three study on that, so I hope we'll see what will happen. And there is another issue that, you know, the period, the time, between surgery and radiotherapy is important. Normally, ideally, it should be between four to six weeks, and if it's longer, then you have a less uh, outcome. So maybe there might be a possibility to do some, give some chemotherapy during this period in order to get off, get rid of this bad influence of this time factor, because some patients with big tumors, when you operate, they don't come out easily from the hospital, they have complications, etc., etc. So that's not because you have a waiting list time or something like that, that you're waiting for eight, eight weeks, but you cannot treat the patient, just you have to wait to the healing. So uh, there is a phase two American RTOG study who use docetaxel in these patients uh, during the uh, post-operative period, which also an interesting way to go. There was a phase three study presented ASCO last year using lapatinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor combined to radiochemotherapy. So huge phase three study, more than 800 patients, radiochemotherapy versus radiochemotherapy plus lapatinib during treatment and thereafter, which, which was negative as well. You know, the, the curves were completely similar. Maybe immunotherapy, but we don't have any uh, anything on the post-operative setting. Now we know in the metastatic setting it works, so probably there will be some uh, phase one to, or not phase one, but phase two the trials on the definitive setting. Maybe we'll come to the post-operative as well. That can be also very interesting. For advanced disease, operated advanced disease, the post-operative chemoradiotherapy is important, we have to give it, if possible, whenever it's possible medically. For oral cavity cancers, the use of induction chemotherapy, which it may be interesting. There is a Chinese phase three randomized study published in the JCO two years ago, which showed that in terms of overall survival, doing induction chemotherapy before surgery and then do tailored radiochemotherapy or chemo radiotherapy after the surgical uh, specimen compared to upfront surgery and postoperative chemoradiotherapy, there was no difference at all. But the issue is not to have a difference at all because probably the, the induction chemotherapy will not bring anything to the overall survival. We were expecting in the beginning to maybe you will have less metastatic disease later on. But the issue is that some part of these patients who are not, let's say this trial was done in patients who were, all patients were operable, so randomization. but for inoperable patients or where you can also operable but function, your organ functionality may be better, these kind of patients may benefit from induction chemotherapy, even it doesn't change the final outcome, you may give, do less aggressive surgery and compensate this with postoperative radiotherapy, etc. So that can be an interesting issue for the future.